Mostly dry this evening, but turning cold later with lows of minus one to plus two degrees. Now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Boyle Sports. Now with same-day withdrawals to your Visa debit card. I'm prepared to end it and I can't. Well, do it then. Country again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? Oh, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? <gasps> now then, here we are on the football show. So England are 3-1 uh, up after being 1-0 down away to Montenegro. Third goal courtesy of Ross Barkley, his second. That came on 59 minutes, so... Uh, good response from England. Dan McDonnell is still here, and we have Kieran Cunningham as well, Chief Sports Writer with the Irish Daily Star. Hello, thanks for joining us. Yeah, how are you? Quiet time. We'll yeah. have uh, Gary Breen later on, who is more so just going to talk on the football side of things. Mm. There is a pretty big game tomorrow, which will define how we look back on this first international window. We haven't even touched on the Gibraltar performance. Mm. Kieran, you were watching on TV. Dan, you were in the wind. I was watching the director's box, <laughs> yeah. as, as I've discussed before, so people who've watched yeah. on TV might have seen more of the game than we did, to be honest. Yeah. I, I, I watched it very closely on TV, and I would say, Kieran, it did look miserable. The extent of the wind, I think, did come yeah. across. You could see the ball dying in the air when it well, was going against the Well, I don't think two minutes ever... I don't think a minute went past without Jim Bevan or George Hamilton referring yeah. to it, so Trust I think us. it was hammered home to us that very it was windy. windy. Uh, I would give... Mm, you don't want to say a free pass, but I really would come pretty close to giving everybody concerned a yeah, free pass in such so. horrible conditions on the uh, first day of uh, the first match for Mick McCarthy as well. A lot of extenuating circumstances there. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Like I remember um, being at the San Marino game years ago, and you know we got a late winner with St- Stephen Earl one two one, and all the players were just putting out the line afterwards. You know, it's three points, three points. A win is a win. And there was similar stuff at the weekend, but it, it, there was more substance to it because of the conditions, mm. I think, really. And the goal was really wor- well worked. Now, there were positives. It was a really good goal. I thought there was more signs of, uh, you know, men- more energy to the team and more signs of aggressive pre- pressing and more. they were trying to pass the ball more. So it's, it's early days, but, uh, you know, they got to win. A diff- like, tomorrow was a inter- far more interesting game yeah. and a far bigger test because... Georgia, the last game we played against them was a draw. Five of the six competitive wins were by a single goal. Like they've given, they're t- they're tough. Or they've been tough for Ireland, mm. definitely. And also with all the atmosphere, the stuff that's going to be around the game, I think the 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 mood could be quite ugly. And if it's still scoreless at half time, mm. I think there could be a lot of pressure on the team. Mm. And it could well be scoreless at half time. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm, we'll see. We'll see what. I mean, obviously, it's very hard to talk about the game without putting it in the context of other developments that are ongoing. And I don't know, I think whatever I think whatever protest that there is, I get the sense that whatever protest there is, it'll probably be maybe early on in the game and that'll be it. And then it'll, it'll turn back to the match. I think that's the discussion that's sort of knocking around the place, I think. And we're definitely uh, ruling out tennis balls. I don't, I don't think there's, I'm not sure. The ten- I mean, the irony is it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, the tennis balls. People are going to go out and buy tennis balls now. Yeah. That's I the thing. Like, now I think stewards will be told now to make sure bring, nobody has tennis people balls. People might have to bring tennis balls now just in case. <laughs> The, the tennis balls could be like a cruel, viewed as cruel commentary on like technical ability, you know, because players are encouraged People to, to, to text that train in. with a tennis ball. Would you bring a Schlitter? Someone texted and said, imagine, Schlitter imagine, do? imagine the players trying to control those tennis balls, which oh. I thought was a bit Would hard. you bring a Schlitter now? Well, I don't mean... Oh, you then, then, then we'd have that, the GEA claiming credit dangerous. for inspiring yeah. the team. I think you know? the ridge, the, the, the yeah. more painful maybe. Yeah. So uh, in terms of what's going on today, uh, Mick McCarthy said, look... Please don't. It's not going to help us play any better, that's for sure. So hopefully that's not the case, the tennis ball, that is. They're coming to watch a football match. They don't want, uh, they want us to win the game give us the best chan- and to give us the best chance. And that's getting behind us and not having any outside influences affecting that. But I can't do anything about it. Maybe I'll take a tennis racket, <laughs> which is uh, hmm. typical Mick McCarthy. In terms of other bits and bobs that have happened today, SIP2 have come out, as you might expect. It's the kind of, these are the kind of angles that happen. Hmm. I suppose around a story like this, their um, sports sector organizer Dennis Hines, FAI employees were enduring reductions in salary between 10% and 15%, which were implemented in what was meant to be a temporary basis in 2012. This issue has particularly incensed our members because when the cuts in pay were originally imposed, John Delaney stated he was taking a similar reduction. However, it would now seem to be the case that in 2016, the FAI decided to reimburse the reduction in its CEO uh, salary through 
a payment in kind on a large property, our members had to wait until January 2019 to receive final restoration of pay. Beyond that, not much has happened today. There's been no major developments, no FAI statements for starters. Mm. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the big change. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the last time there was a day without a statement, we got 1,900 words the next day, so just be careful <laughs> what you wish for. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's probably a bit more sustained now in terms of the commentary, and sometimes, I mean, touched on this a small bit earlier, I think there's an element of people reacting to the way that the wind is blowing, particularly from a political point of view. Because mm. yeah. this is something that we lacked before, um, that we really lacked... Uh, when there was stories, I think, that were of huge public interest, uh, but there wasn't really an appetite to, to get stuck into them. And there was a view that, well, this is an FEI matter, and, and, and that's fair enough. I guess when you're, some of those instances you were talking about, maybe personality effects rather than stuff related to money and even stuff with the tickets, I mean, it was bad decisions maybe rather than uh, inappropriate use of funds. So I guess I can see why that, but I also think as well that some people are just opportunistic too and they sense that uh, there was a time when being in maybe the FEI's camp or being uh, in John Delaney, it was Alan Kelly was speaking about being pals with sort of John Delaney and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, now it's funny, all these, I was looking at the Eurotus Committee on, on Sport the other day and I think it might be new in Karen, or certainly someone was speaking before about how these committee uh, hearings can be very unsatisfactory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've certainly that would be the view. However, I think there's such scrutiny on this one now that I feel all the people that are on it are going to be under pressure to perform. Well, it would be I, their most watched performance I, I looked through the list. in a long yeah, yeah. time. I looked through the list of the people that are on the committee. To, and obviously, we'd heard from Noel Rock. We'd heard from Catherine, Catherine Murphy. Murphy yeah. uh, there had been suggestions to other people. But now the other people on the committee are coming forward. There was an independent, as Porrigo Cady's on the committee, who suddenly I saw him on the news today. Yeah, Seems yeah. like they're all all, they're all coming out. So if you're on that committee and saying nothing now, yeah, yeah. what the hell is going on with you? Mm. So uh, I, I actually think that there is a momentum building that might actually make this thing, this event, this talking shop exercise more significant than it was before. Yeah. But it, 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 there's, an, there's always an element of grandstanding about these things. And, and you can judge it that way. But maybe at times in the past that was needed. Too, because what effects change? As I said, <clears> the same people complaining about the FAI who can be decried as well. There you go; they've got an agenda. Even even when Brian Kerr complains, he gets that. Yeah, yeah. So let's 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 hear it from other voices and see where Just it brings us. To let people know, Harry Kane has scored a fourth for England as we speak. Seventy minutes on the clock. Really good goal. Raheem Sterling using all his pace gets down the right hand side, squares the ball for Kane. He calmly tucks it away, and that's that for England four one win. To jog people's memory of the last Oireachtas committee. Well, one, John Delaney had to go early, if you yeah, remember. Yeah. That was one of the issues. And rather than question, answer, question, answer, and a real emphasis on getting answers, there were like numerous questions from numerous different Oireachtas members. Yeah, and multi-part questions yeah. from individuals, Yeah, which and is really, always a mistake. Delaney was yeah. free then to answer what he wanted yeah, to Yeah, just answer, pick and choose, yeah. And Absolutely, not things yeah. he didn't want. So and the, that was yeah, similar it, with the IABA when they were up, up, is that right? up in yeah, front yeah. of them after the Billy Walsh uh, affair when like Billy if, went if, to if America. You look at how a federal hearing is conducted in the States quite often. Yeah. Um, each representative is given time, as in you have your five, six, seven minutes. Yeah, yeah. And you can boom, 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 get back and forth. Yeah. No, hang on, so you haven't, you haven't answered that, come back to yeah. me. And as opposed to this, I'm going to ask my six questions, now I'm going to hand over to Kieran. Kieran lists out six questions, then Dan lists out yeah. six questions. And then everyone's forgetting, forgotten what my first question yeah, was yeah. anyway. Or, or the UK parliamentary yeah, briefing really on sport, they're yeah. very well briefed mm. and they're very much on top of, of, of whatever. They also seem to work together. In front of me. Yeah, yeah, they put a lot of work into it. But it's interesting when you put a lot of this into context that this new role the executive vice president John Delaney has and all the stuff about he's taking a substantial wage cut and the wor the figure that's going out there now is on 120,000 a year that's roughly what John Tracy has paid as CEO of Sport Ireland and Sport Ireland uh, look after 73 national govern governing bodies in sport mm. like so it just hammers home how overpaid John Delaney was for so long mm. and like now Quinn has referred to this on TV earlier but like the new situation, uh, you're basically looking at twin track CEOs, but he's cherry picked. He seems to have cherry picked. 
Good stuff. The more glamorous stuff, yeah. And also, I, uh, the only thing we seem to be involved in here is the John Giles Foundation, would that be right? Well, Everything else is outside the country. The, the John, yeah, well, the John Giles Foundation, yeah, that, that, yeah, that, that, was, that was... Yeah, but that's some relationship we've cultivated for a long time. Because one of, yeah. was something we might get into is one of the things that facilitated uh, John Delaney's rise was the way he cultivated the media in his early days. Both... Uh, individual journalists and the RT panel, because at the time the RT panel was seen to have a lot of power. And all those relationships helped. You know, the media... T- 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 they made them to a degree. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, maybe, not, maybe that's maybe overstating it, but they certainly... To a large them. extent, it is true, Dan. Interestingly, um, Eamon Dunphy, who was on the Marion Finucane show yesterday, I didn't... Yeah. <laughs> well, OK. Go on. I'd have my views on that, Joe. Uh, I'd have my views on that. For a start, wasn't well briefed. You know, didn't seem to know the situation with the loan. Thought that the loan was paid Wouldn't back. Be the first time in that in topic. June 2018, mm. as opposed to June 2017, which is a fairly basic yeah. part of the story. But it's very striking that in the Daily Star today, he seems to have done a complete 180, and he is now saying, Not for the first time, he's now saying, "I hold my hands up, I hold my hands up. I got this wrong. Again. Delaney has to go." Yeah. He's, he's had more he's had more flip flops in the last six months on this than it's, than it's sort of extraordinary. Flip. But that yeah. was that is a, a sizable uh, flip flop. And in fairness, he, look, he comes out and says, "I hold my hands up. I actually got this wrong, and I was too focused on the football side of things." So, just if you heard Marion Finucane yesterday, which I'm sure a lot of people did, given it's a massive show, you may not have realised that Eamon Dunphy today in the Star has now said, "Actually, there needs to be root and branch change. I got this whole thing wrong mm. on uh, Delaney." He's also, sorry, not to divert too much, responsible for Aviva Stadium activities. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Broad enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need There's to. Some big that. events coming to the stadium. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> What it. does that mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that's. Well, it's. it's uh, I don't know. I mean, this has come out across the review, of course. Mm. You know? Yeah. You, you think, though, actually, if you were appointing a CEO, the part of it would be to actually the new CEO and the collaborative uh, executive vice president partner, they would actually sit down and discuss which skill sets and which roles might actually suit them best. Mm. Because what happens now if you get an applicant for, a, for the CEO position who's actually hugely talented when it comes to a you know, well-traveled, yeah. you know, an experienced football administrator, someone who's, I don't know, been the CEO of a Premier League club or something like that, you know, and knows a lot about rights deals and yeah. arrangements and, you know, someone from... If you're looking for, like, if you think that you want a CEO, I assume there's no... There's no limit on it to outside candidates. I assume you can go for people from experience in the football world mm. uh, in any way. Yet we're somehow we're, we're actually we're talking about a particular type of candidate because in some ways we're imagining that it's going to be a parochial. There's going to be a parochial aspect to it that it's someone who's worked in the FAI before. Do you have you to have experience in the football world? Do you I think? I'm not even sure if you do. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't think. Like I would think somebody like Gary Keegan would be a brilliant candidate because of his track record and the way everybody has ever dealt with him raves about him mm-hmm. and he has a huge amount of experience in sport but not in soccer and you, would you would you need to be, I, I, I don't know it's an interesting I question. Question. I think it's open for debate I think yeah. I think you throw it out to see, to see what happens I, see I, I I suppose like what is the role of a CEO I mean this is a title this is a, this is a sort of an argument that you can discuss here because a lot of the commentary some of the commentary around John Delaney today from some of John Delaney's avid backers in leagues around the country is related to stuff to me that I'm not even sure if it yeah. like like this thing well John Delaney's been to Kerry and he is uh, he has delivered grants to Kerry and he's and he's delivered grants to Monaghan and, and so on like okay some of that money will have, of course the FBI will contribute to projects but primarily you talk about grant funding you're talking about um, state funds which is yeah. put into football and the FBI decide where it goes mm. like it's the dispensation of that as part of the thing rather than this suggestion that if this board leaves there is going to be no ability there to generate funding for sport from outside sources I think established see, you know people that are CEOs and work for companies they yeah. They could lobby for their company. They're capable of of doing this, you know. Yeah. And but so, I think it's important. And sell tickets yeah. and all these packages yeah. and projects. I don't think you necessarily need to be a football networker and go to two thousand clubs to be a good CEO of the FEI. Yeah. Can, I, can, and that, I, can, I, can that, I be just a little bit Machiavellian about this for a second? So here is Niall Quinn speaking to Virgin Media earlier on, and he was asked if he'd be interested in the CEO role. Under absolutely no circumstances will I be applying for the job given the current remit of where this job sits. Uh, I don't think it reads as a CEO role at all. 
I think it reads as half a CEO role, and anybody going in there will have a huge shadow over them because the departing CEO hasn't departed at all, and it would make life very, very difficult. And quite frankly, I think it's a little bit of a charade. Given the scrutiny that was in place over the last week, the rush of the uh, appointment, the unanimous decision of the board to tell us all late on a Saturday night in the middle of uh, some serious scrutiny on the, uh, on the CEO at that time, that this was best for, for, the, for the association and it was a great move and everybody should back it. We're not buying it. I'm not buying it. And I think that's a, a, an ill-conceived con, Ill decision that needs to be looked at again, in my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll say it again. It's a half a CEO role and it's a role, I think, at this stage, if it stays in its current remit, it's for a gilly. Somebody who's just there to be a... Uh well, how can you bring in? How can you bring in your passion, your drive, your your everything that? And it could, this could be a man or woman, whoever the right candidate is. How can they go in there with this great vision, this great ability as a CEO? In every other company in the world, the CEO can make great decisions throughout the the, the association or, or the organisation that they're in. With the departing CEO not departing at all and taking responsibilities for some of the some of the probably the the plum prettier roles in terms of heading off to UEFA. The glamorous and, jobs. The glamorous jobs, and, but also the importance of, of, of those jobs. <coughs> um, it just doesn't sit right, and it's he, he he's been around a long time. He's done it. Uh, he's had his go. It's uh, probably high time now that a different that a different FAI appear. We've a, we've a moment in time now, as an association, as a, as a football-loving country, to see real change, and this is a bit of a fudge. So to pick up the Machiavellian trend, if you agree with Noel Quinn there, and I suspect all of us do really, on the nature of this CEO role, it will prohibit really good, strong people from throwing their hat into the ring. Absolutely. And therefore it's a circular thing, that all, all the fears that the new CEO will not be given his or her head. Yeah will absolutely come true because, you know, you, you'll rule out the, any of the strong contenders who would want to go in and really change things. They're going to look at this, see it for what it is, what we think it might be, what Niall Quinn thinks it is, not apply. Yeah. And whoever does get the job might be a, a lesser person. That would be the fear. And they'll be completely dominated in this uh, collaborative, quote unquote, relationship with the executive vice president. Yeah. Yeah. Because over the last 14, 15 years, the FAI has turned into D Delaney land that it's, his, it's become his personal fiefdom. He surrounded himself with his own people. And uh, he's still going to be there. Mm. And you're going to have somebody in there and they're just going to be a face. And like, the, the whole thing stinks. Like, it makes no sense. Like, even this, him getting this title of executive vice president and all the way that's linked in seemingly with... If you have that title, it will help them stay on the UEFA executive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. I, 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 can, I think there's a huge amount of anger out there. And I think the, the rent issue is massive. I think that's annoyed a hell of a lot of people, more than a lot of other issues. Because €36,000 a year is what a lot of people earn, or more than they earn. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and this is a guy that was earning a huge salary, and that rent was paid for. You know, so... You know, all this talk that he'd taken a wage cut, and if you add 360 and 36,000, mm. you've nearly 400,000, it wasn't much of a wage cut. Well, we were saying earlier that a key question now has to be, what, give us the full expenses list when it comes to John Delaney. Yeah, because credit there, there card was, bills, was, everything. All that, I think no, there should be called for a lot of uh, there was no transparency. There was yeah. no transparency over the rent issue. None. Uh, no. This appeared in the paper. Yeah, so and like this does, 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 does happen with does big. This does yeah. happen with yeah. big multinationals. Totally. But, but this is a sporting organisation. It doesn't happen with sporting organisations, especially in a tiny country like Ireland. Mm. Yeah, especially when the, you know, that person like lives in the country. You know, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it. They yeah. have been brought from overseas. Yeah. I, I, as I said, it's it's a motive. It's it's the figure. It's almost the specifics of it. It's almost like it's it's part of the. It's part of a script of some kind that the amount mm. resonates with people who've been in contact with me and other people and we've heard them speaking at various at various forums but I had a fact that there was people on that type of salary who were let go or had the salary yeah, cut yeah. in half and you know, salaries which initially were co-funded in some cases anyway. Mm. And uh, it's been austerity. It's been a time for the FBI where I think people who care about football have worked hard 
you know, accepted that cutbacks had to be made. You know, they, so, well, some had to go, but others just got on with it. And, and okay, the argument would be, I'm trying to put myself in the mind of the people who would say, well, John Lennon generated a lot of money for the association during the time and so on, and that would be the argument that you would hear. But it just, it just doesn't... It just no. doesn't sit right in any For me, that's a, bit, that's a bit like Arsene Wenger built the Emirates. Like every uh, football association across the world brought yeah, and in more also, money. And football sorry. transformed over John Delaney's no, and, uh, tenure. He didn't bring in the money but, as such. TV rights went up. Mm. Sponsorship went up. Yeah. All of that stuff went up. Well, he that would, would have happened regardless. Well, he will argue, you know, he was part of the centralised TV rights deal in the UEFA. He was influential there. But those TV deals well, are going up anyway. That would have John Delaney. But let's, but let's just... Let's, well, if you're going to talk about what you've been involved in and what you've been responsible for, let's just remember that a big reason the cutbacks happened is that the FBI got their pricing for the Aviva Stadium. So badly, yeah. badly, badly wrong. To the extent that when you talk about the prices now yeah. it sounds like it, it was a satirical plan you know to try and fill it yeah. right so uh, and the, the the wonder and the magic of all this is that the board that presided over those decisions around that time they commissioned people to do it so it comes back to you yeah. they're all still there yeah. and they've sanctioned contract extensions for highly paid employees during this time so like and again, by the way, at the moment, these are the people, the, the, the board now, you're still, the, a lot of the main officer roles in the board are filled by people who are there. So they're the ones who've commissioned this review or going forward will be still making decisions in tandem with their new CEO and their new uh, EVP or whatever we call them now. You know, so, like, a lot of the same faces are still there. Yeah. That this is change, it's not change. Mm. But like you referred to earlier, Dan, about like, what exactly does a CEO do? And one of the main things a CEO to do has to do is make the big, the biggest decisions, the biggest calls, and the biggest call in the 15 years he was there was the funding of the Viva, mm. and it got, couldn't have got it more wrong. Yeah. And that's the legacy. You can bring up everything else, the underage leagues, and you know, there's positive appointments. There's people like Tom Mohun doing great work that have been put in, put in positions. And you know, over 15 years, any, anybody in charge is going to have those kind of plus yeah. points. But the big one, he got, couldn't have got it more wrong. Yeah. And, like, no, I, and I he do, was worried I, about it. Like, this was highlighted that, at the time. I do have some sympathy in that the world's economy collapsed. But it was But it was highlighted at the time. It was highlighted at the time that he delayed far too long. The IRFU went, went into the market earlier and with a more sensible price uh, well, structure. Hang on a second, hang on. Going into the market earlier, nobody knew Lehman Brothers was about so, to go. Not, in the re not, no, not really. Like, none of us knew the extent of the economic crash that was around the corner. So, in some respects, that was really unfortunate timing. Joe, However, there, I would argue, though, um, there's been Joe. such a lack of investment in football. This business about getting the debt cleared by 2020 is very questionable, Joe. and he's never come out and explained that. Let me just that go back to that thing. point for a yeah, second. Yeah, but I, I would. <coughs> we'll come back. To, we'll, we'll the argument second. about selling the tickets at the time. No, let the quotes from the time 2009 was about the number of millionaires that yeah. existed in the country at that point. Right, 3, millionaires don't become millionaires by paying 3,200 per year for a calendar <laughs> year where you can play one competitive game, which Ireland did. Rugby has a consistency of fixtures yeah. over a period. The previous FEI tickets were I think 7,500 uh, for a 10 year period and that was when Ireland had a better team mm. okay so I mean that, that 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 this sensible pricing structure or that this pricing structure they had would have worked if it wasn't that people were going to go out there and buy them I'm sorry that's just not true okay that, that's just not true at all so how much line. was he charging it was from 1200 per year to 3200 per year see i think if the economic crash didn't happen it's perfectly conceivable people would have paid somewhere think about the money that was being spent grand. 32 grand well, well, over 10 years it's 32 grand yeah, I, they wanted up front, uh, up people up front initially, up front money was being sought initially, I honestly, then they went for a direct debit plan. I honestly think there were people spending 3,000 quid a year IRF in, was a far, 15, in a far more ridiculous way. The IRFU went for 15, 15 grand or 1,500, yeah, sure. that's a year after the Croke Park, Ireland, England and rugby coming to the fore. Sure. So I, I, I'm sorry, like, I, the, no. Like the take Joe, up, would the you go, Joe, go, go, go back and look at the media coverage of it at the time, yeah. before Lehman Brothers crashed and all the coverage and all the analysis was saying this is way overpriced this, they've got oh, this wrong sorry look and there was opportunities i covered this around the time on, joe on, there was opportunities to 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 <coughs> put the prices that were discussed and the policy that was taken to go direct debit instead of changing and what happened was people went direct debit and then of course what happened then yes this is when the economic picture comes into it the the we have real problems then and people just cancel the direct debits fine so, but we, I think it's worth including that, that people... And then did, people who paid the tickets... Sorry, sorry Dan, you're interrupting yeah, me a lot here. Yeah. Like, let me put forward my side for a second on this. I'm not saying it was perfect. Okay, far from it. I'm just saying 
if we're, if we're trying to be journalistic about this and fair, then the economic crash, the worst of which hopefully we'll ever live through, was a factor. It was really unfortunate time. And if you're judging the decision uh, fairly, it was a factor. The fact that people went for the direct debit scheme would suggest, look, people were spending their money on some dumb shit, you know? Like, there was some mad stuff happening in the country. Uh, but was it overpriced? Yes. Absolutely, I accept that. Was it compounded by the economic crash? crash? You have to say it was. Uh, but the decision to not invest anything in Irish football teams, make all the cutbacks and get rid of the debt by 2020, I'd argue that's never been explained properly. That bugs me more than anything. I think This rush to get it paid off. I think there's possibly an element of that which could be influenced by media coverage. I have to say this, you know, being sceptical about their ability to be debt-free by 2020. Yeah. And I certainly would have cast doubt over that and people would have cast doubt over that. And perhaps in that context... Has there been a drive to be debt free to say we said we'll be debt free by mm. 2020? And I've certainly had people contact me with a sort of, you know, a financial background, certainly more of a financial background than me that said, you know, debt isn't such a bad thing. You know, you can manage it over a period of time. Of and I do think, is there an element of pride involved that, in that well, because of statements that, is my that were point. made? And I also think John Delaney has big ambitions long term with UEFA. What better thing than in 2020 to have European Championship Games in Dublin to show everybody around and say debt free we did on it. my watch? We did it. You said yeah. you wouldn't. Yeah. And I think. That has been, and Brian Kerr is on the record as saying there's been a complete lack of investment in Irish football. Yeah. And it's to pay off the debt in this stadium. The debt's manageable. Kick yeah. the debt down to 20, like 30, 20, 40. Put, Every, everybody lives with course, debt. Of course. Put more money debt. into yeah. Irish football. Yeah. But I think there has been an element to one, prove the media wrong, and two, in 2020, to show it off and say, debt free, under my watch, this is the kind of magic I can pull off. Mm. And that's, that's never been examined or teased out properly. He never does interviews. The board never talk about it. It's never explained. Mm. Yeah, no, and uh, I'd like to hear more from other members of the board as well. I think that's another point to be made here. Who are who? Like, yeah. who, who are these? Who are, who They're are long-standing the people within Irish football. I mean, they've been there for a long time. I know there's an argument that, and, and I, I do accept this as well. I mean, other members of the board are volunteers. You know, like there are volunteer members who have, who have a long relationship with football, and there will be people in clubs and leagues who've dealt with them who will vouch for their good service. And I'm not. It's it, sometimes it comes across like you're being ageist yeah. or you're trying to. But it's just my point is, as we touched. Ireland. There's a lot of people involved in football in Ireland and just revolution changed two or three years, new ideas. If you had ideas about the stadium or a plan, okay, maybe it didn't work, you can debate it. After four or five years, I mean, there hasn't been an election for a board position of substance, a public one, I think, in around a decade in yeah, terms yeah. of the AGM. So it seems like are, are the football family, have they been delighted with the job that, that has been done? Yet we hear like the Sib2, FAI staff, right? FAI staff through Sib2 are outlining their grievances, yet all the delegates and council members who go to the FEI AGM next year have had no grievances, over the past 10 years, have had no grievances at all. Yeah. So where's the disconnect here? There's mm. a disconnect somewhere between various strands of, again, this football family. Yeah. Uh, how damaged do you suspect John Delaney is in so much as you can tell about the new role? How do you mean, sorry? The power he has over the FAI. It's very hard to tell, isn't it? Mm, it's very hard. I think he's damaged. I think yeah. he's definitely lost. To be power. honest, I think uh, the long game that so he's sure. been—I think the I long game know. that he's been playing is more in, is interesting as well in terms of UEFA, because uh, I was reading very—you uh, you know Philip O'Connor, the the Dublin yeah. journalist who, who, who's based in Stockholm, but he had a piece today and just talking about people he's dealt with over the years in European football in Scandinavia, etc. And he says they all love Delaney. He says, they, they, no, and he has this hail fellow well-met persona when he wants to, and he can get on with people, mm -hmm. and he can charm people. And he, he seems to be very well got in, the, in wider, uh, in, in the Europe, the football family, as he likes to call it, across Europe. Yeah. And he, he clearly has ambitions there. And um, how closely are people there looking at internal FAI politics here and the distinction between a CEO and a executive vice president, I doubt if they're paying much attention at all. Oh, so if you're looking at the long game, he's 51, 52 years old, whatever he is, I don't think it's damaged him be, uh, that much. I wouldn't be surprised if after Euro 2020, if he gets mm. the games here, if he moved on. It wouldn't surprise me. Well, that, that, no. would, that would tie in with the debt-free state. But your argument, so you, and it's sort of back, you, you said it has, is his power damaged. I mean, if it, I'm just thinking they're going to unveil a new CEO in May yeah. or maybe at the end of the AGM in July. The first question for the new CEO or one of the questions for a new CEO at a, who will have to come out and answer questions consistently would be if things stay as they are now. Yeah. Do you, like what power does the CEO, the chief executive officer, have over 
John Delaney in they've, terms they've, they've of reviewing worked, their performance. They, they work together. They work together collaboratively. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, you know, okay, so is the CEO there to deal with, say, the taking a say in the hiring and firing of managers because John Delaney is naturally very much so he, he went to meet Martin O'Neill when they were discussing a sort of a mutual consent break would have been the same with Trapattoni John Delaney's spoken about how those issues were difficult for him to deal with and so on after the relationship so the CEO I guess deals with that but what happens if the CEO if there's an issue related to the executive vice president that so is it the board then or is it the CEO who comes out and speaks about mm. any decisions that are taken relative to that See, it's also vague. It's going to be dependent on the personality of the CEO. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, this and ba- if you if you take the Ni- if you follow the Niall Quinn uh, response through to its logical conclusion, anybody who's serious is going to really think twice about getting involved. Yeah. Uh, if a CEO, if the CEO has previously worked for John Delaney, who was a CEO at the time, I think that's going to that's going to raise those questions. Yeah. Well, I think whoever comes in and if, if, if he eventually moves on, mm-hmm. it needs to be somebody who could not be more different. Like I was just looking through old interviews I did with John Delaney yesterday and there was quotes like, uh, everywhere I go, people ask me for autographs and selfies and like a stand ovation. And I was thinking, why are you telling me that and why do you care? Like you're a sports administrator. You know, why was a sports, like Malachy Clarkin wrote a, yeah. a, bit yeah. of a very good comment about this today, but like, why was a, did a sports administrator agree to do a documentary saying he was great? Yeah. Like, you couldn't imagine that happening with any other uh, sports administrator in Ireland. Why would you agree to pose for the front of Sunday Independent Life magazine with models and celebrities, etc.? Like, it just makes no sense. You don't want that. Like, that's why I, you would look at some really top pros like Gary Keegan or whoever else comes into it that are low-key and just yeah. get on with a job, like Philip Brown, like to, and I are for you, like Tom Ryan in the GA, and that you don't want somebody who just seems to be bigger than Irish football, and that Irish football, a lot of people in it seem to think they need him. Yeah. Nobody is, ne- uh, is indispensable. Graveyards are full of people that were indispensable. If, if, if the Irish game is, it's this the thing, and I t- completely agree with all those points, if John Delaney like, has, has done a very good job as CEO, then surely the, him departing would be no great shakes in many respects because you have a strong association behind you and yeah. someone naturally moves on to their next job and the structures that are left there are so good that it's a seamless transition it's a handover that's that's what happens mm. does does it revolve around one man if it does then something's wrong yeah yeah. And the other thing, I think he gets credit for stuff that has nothing to do with him. Like this whole stuff over the grassroots, a lot of the funding of grassroots developments comes through the Sports Capital Grant Scheme, which is administered through Department of Sport and Sport Ireland, and there's very strict criteria you have to meet to get any of those grants, and there's matching funds, etc. involved. Mm. So it's not like John Delaney sits in Abenstown and decides... Oh, I'll send 50,000 to Stella Mars or St. Yeah, it's, Joseph it's Boys or anything. Fast, yeah. But people seem to think, have this idea he's looked after clubs all over the world. There's, there's no doubt that grassroots facilities have improved over the past 15 yeah, years. Yeah, but a lot Massively. of that isn't down to the FAI. Uh, oh, no, that's the thing. But it's, yeah. natural, it's a natural evolution yeah. as well because the bar was set so low initially. Yeah. And yeah. <coughs> this is what <coughs> must be said. Like, it is, when John Delaney speaks about professionalising aspects of the FAI, it's a fair point. It is a fair point because what was there before, you know, growing the employees that was there, we didn't really have it. Yeah. Like through the 80s and 90s with the glory days of Irish football, we never capitalised on it. So structures were put in that weren't there. Yeah. But there's a difference between that and suggesting that they couldn't have been done by anyone else. Co- totally. and, that, and that there aren't people out there with the calibre and the, the ability. Because football, has a, a, like all sport, has a massive like social value. It's important. It's good for like the, the state, for health, for everything. Yeah. And I, I don't think football wouldn't be getting these things. If, no. if we had a different hierarchy. No, uh, it, it's like this business that John Delaney brought in a lot of money. Are you telling me TV money and sponsorship money wouldn't have flowed in anyway? Well, this has somehow been created as a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to go to Gary Breen in a second. He's uh, keener to talk about football. He's not, by his own admission, um, too on top of the ins and outs of this whole situation to the point where he wants to comment overly publicly. Uh, are they going to ride this out is the really interesting question. I would suspect they will. I think he'll weather a tricky enough Oroctus uh, committee hearing. I think he's a pretty smooth operator, experienced and uh, personable. And there'll be articles saying, well, it was a farce. And then they'll announce a new CEO. And then six, seven, eight months will go down the line. And I think our executive vice president will have his feet under the table and be, be OK. Does any, or, that's barring any further revelations, maybe in a Sunday newspaper, which are unforeseeable. But if, if nothing else happens, 
then I think we're looking at a CEO, Executive Vice President John Delaney combo for the foreseeable. I think I, I'm not so sure. No, I wouldn't. I think so it's sure. turned. I think it's. I think it's. It's so sustained yeah. this time. Uh, I don't know. I think. I, I think Saturday's move would have worked a couple of years ago. I, I, I take your point. I mean, the, the 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 storms that happened before, say the FIFA five million, even the the singing of the song and stuff. And I, I would have been stronger in some of them than others to some degree, you know. Yeah. But there was there was a there was people coming out able to explain. Well, actually, no. This is this was a this was a good thing, or I can see what he was going for there. More so related to the the FIFA five million, for example, mm. and so on. I, I just don't see where the backing's coming from. And I think the political stuff is just, uh, in a way, people just, it seems like th there's a keenness to distance themselves from him. And I think he should be pretty alarmed about that. I don't know how, what, what makes this all go away this time. Mm. And then, w will somebody replace him as executive vice president? <laughs> 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 This is a big job, you know. It's 120 grand. I this just, is a new, I'm, this is a new six-figure yeah. job that's just cropped up. Conscious that Jonathan Hall Associates felt it was crucial, so now you can't just disbar their advice. Yeah, can you? <laughs> how can you call yourself a football association without an executive vice president? See, they said it was crucial to really elevate the FAI to the next level. An executive vice president was key. Mm. So you can't not have someone in that role now. Why do you not have an executive president? And have you have an executive <laughs> I, vice president? I don't know. Surely that's coming next week, isn't it? I don't know. It's probably a statement being drafted as we speak. So, Dan, by the way, back to where it got heated. Are we agreeing that 3,200 was reasonable <laughs> value or just a little bit of I'm never going to agree with you on that. Sorry, <laughs> no, like. I'm sorry. I, it was completely overpriced. I'm just saying it was compounded. And uh, by the economic crash. Okay, com compounded is one, yeah. cause is another, I guess. You know, yeah, do you yeah, know what I mean? We can agree on that. We yeah. can agree on that. We can yeah. agree on that for sure. And look, the RFU weren't caught, so certainly not to the same extent. Yeah. So, yeah. look, I'm with you on that point. But uh, uh, the reason I brought that up was more this uh, 2020, we have to be debt-free obsession. Which mm, yeah. I, I was never on board with that. I know. And I will say one thing, that, that around that time in 2008 or so, and certainly there was discussions about the possibility of a third party incurring the risk. Now, the FBI will say that they never turned down an offer, and I'm, I'm, that may well be true in terms of whether a formal offer materialised, but there were certainly discussions around the concept, and the, the FBI president at the time was quoted as saying they were very confident of going their own way on this project. And that's something to be considered as well. A short break, Gary Breen next. Football on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Boyle Sports. Now with same-day withdrawals to your Visa debit card. Moncrief. Dave says, I like to bathe in my own urine. Uh, so you do want to interview me now or shall we arrange a date? Well, I don't want to go on a date with you, Dave. Uh, I'm spoken for, but thanks very much uh, for the offer. The thing is, Dave, is it just you bathing in your own urine or is there a whole philosophy that goes with it? Is it empowering to people? Are you leading by example somehow? If there's no philosophy that goes along with it, Dave, then you're just a sick pervert and never contact the show again. Moncrief. Sponsored by 123.ie. Weekdays from 2 p.m. On News Talk. Football Index is reinventing football betting. You can buy and sell the world's top players. Their value may go up and down, but it's not over with the final whistle like a regular bet. Football Index reinventing football betting. Start building your portfolio today at footballindex.co.uk or download the app now. New customers only, minimum deposit and conditions apply. Gamble responsibly. This is Dr. Laura Heavey from Medsans Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, making an urgent appeal for the people affected by Cyclone Edai and the flooding disaster. Our teams are on the ground in Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi, treating people devastated by the cyclone. We are massively scaling up our response, but we need your help. Please make an urgent donation today. Free phone 1800 905 509. That's 1800 905 509 or visit msf.ie. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Now you're welcome back. England 5-1 winners uh, against Montenegro. Gary Breen's with us evening, Gary. Good evening, guys. Did you catch yeah. any of England tonight? I saw a couple of the goals and they look devastating on the canvas. Mm. They're so quick, they're so mm. incisive. They're the modern day um, European power, I think, at the moment. Them and France, I think the old guys like Spain, Italy, Holland, Germany. 
or in a period of transition, and I don't think they'd be able to cope with their power and pace. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's uh, usually you'd be on much earlier when we're talking about the football. I know you were you were saying to JP, you're not overly keen to get into the ins and outs of this on the national airwaves. Uh, but I'm sure what you can certainly agree with is that this thing has become uh, the most ridiculous distraction. Mick McCarthy today literally had to talk about the potential of fans bringing a load of tennis balls to the match tomorrow and chucking them onto the pitch in protest at what's going on. Uh, like, you know, the FAI have tried to say that um, this is all part of a, a, a plan, the move of John Delaney to executive vice president, and that this, you know, this has been long in the planning. But you look at the timing, you look at the uh, controversy it's created, uh, there is no way this is part of a plan, and Mick McCarthy will not be thanking anyone in the FAI for this. No, he won't be, and it is a distraction in terms of that, in terms of the questions having to be answered, but it won't be in terms of his focus with a squad. And I, and I can guarantee it will be no, it will be, it will be of no concern to the players. All yeah. they'll be focusing on is getting a good performance in. All that stuff can take care of themselves. Them players will just want to put a, a marker down for staying in the team, improving on what's been a rich, wretched 2018, a new manager, new start. That's only their mindset mm. will be. The reason I don't really want to const, um, really give any um opinion on these delays because i'm not really educated enough to know exactly what's going on mm. in terms of listen i i'm seeing the reaction now the timing's dreadful again and and of course on the back of the roy Keane, harry arter declan rice and now this again it's just too much i just want to focus go back on the team where well listen there, there, there's a big enough job there in itself mm. we were um well, certainly kieran and i i'm not sure uh, dan we were inclined to give the team a bit of a free pass really for Saturday evening, given the conditions, the pitch, the wind, Mick McCarthy's first game, like, did you did you come away disheartened, or was it just one of those nights? Um, I wasn't disheartened. I wouldn't exactly give them a free pass, because I would expect them to to perform better than they did. And the conditions, the pitch, were the same for their players. They they seemed like they weren't too bad about it. But I am also of the mindset. I've been in scenarios before where. It's, you've got nothing really to gain. You've, it's all to lose. You've just got to go in and do a job. And I've no doubt in my mind, the team talked straight away. And Mick and the players have suggested it was something to that was, listen, three points and then let's just get out of here. And they've managed to get the three points. Mm. Well, you, Mick, Mick, Mick McCarthy said afterwards he didn't feel Doherty and McCarthy or Doherty and Coleman worked well on the right-hand side. What did you make of that partnership? I didn't think it did work particularly well, but I don't think that's something we should just throw out the window now. I think it can work well. But I think ultimately the problem you had is that, say for someone like Doherty, he's used to operating all down that flank for walls in his own space. He's never going to get anyone underlapping him, overlapping him. And obviously our captain, that's his strength bombing on. But I think too often in doing so, he actually blocked the areas that Matt Doherty wants to play in. And if you think about the way that Doherty has excelled in the Premier League this year, more often than not, he gets the ball, he looked to play into his centre forward, pass and follow, the centre forward look after the ball, or he certainly got a pass into his advanced midfielder. And at times, not only Seamus Conway was running in and blocking that, but Maguire didn't hold the ball up well enough for international football. McGoldrick at times at 10 was too deep, certainly in that first half. So I think there's a combination of why and certainly um, a reason why he didn't perform as well as he did. The caveat to that as well is that no matter how much we work on it, it's not going to look as fluid as it does for Wolves mm. because of the system, because of the fact that Nuno has worked with him for two years now, day in, day out on the training field. Mm. I don't think, and then Mick said, listen, it is still a very different role, but I still think there is a place for both of them in the team on that right side. I think McGoldrick, uh, almost in a Wes Hoolahan way, was just coming deeper and deeper to try and get in the ball because it wasn't really happening for him. Yeah, I, no, I, listen, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have said the left side was lighting it up either. I wasn't looking over at Ender Stevens, James McLean, thinking, oh, well, there's a well balanced mm. uh, operating left side. They didn't seem to do very much. No, but that, the big debate was Coleman and Doherty are sure. two better Premier League players. Of course, the focus is on that. And uh, yes, and the frustration with McGoldrick, certainly at 10, is that you need your leaders. And Mick will look to empower some of them players to say, what are you doing coming so deep? Get back up there, your midfielders to say, don't be dropping into doing my job. I'll do mm. my job. And in terms of those central midfielders, I know Hendrik got his goal and hopefully that will spur him onto something. I still don't think he dominates as much as he could for a player of his quality. But Hurahan impressed me, especially his dead ball situations where we've had an over-reliance on Robbie Brady, where at times he's been shoehorned into the team when he's not been fit just to give us that avenue to serve into Duffy on set pieces. So the very fact that he can do that now is a great alternative. It puts the emphasis now on Robbie Brady to come into the team and contribute out of those set pieces um, situations. Can he contribute in open play? But he's not alone. And I think this is the challenge that you should have in international football, that someone is there 
to challenge you to maybe take your place. I think James McLean's position will change drastically because if you think about Mick McCarthy and obviously playing centre half for Mick for all those years, you've got a massive emphasis to squeeze that defence up the pitch, mm. to make sure that you engage with the midfielders and get the team up the pitch. Now, if you think about James McLean, who's who's been our go-to man for the last couple of seasons, more often than not, it's been on the back of us defending on the 18-yard box and then him using his power and pace to get us up the pitch. Now he'll have a different challenge. He'll have to operate in tight areas because we will be up there and I'll be fascinated to see if he can deal with it. Yeah. Gary, do you, t- well, you mentioned Sean Maguire there, maybe maybe not holding the ball up as well as he, as he could have on Saturday. Yeah. And I think it was a really frustrating game from him. And I think he said it himself afterwards. Just with the game tomorrow, bigger pitch, different type of yeah. surface. Is, is this still a game for him? Is he still, is it Maguire behind, or sorry, ahead of McGoldrick? Or, or are you suggesting you might tweak it completely for this game? No, listen, I, I, I fully agree with you there. I think this will be a totally different scenario at home. I mean, the very fact that there was no space for him to run into, which he's so good at, I just made the point that when that does happen, international teams work out who their opponents are, so they'll deny him that space. And he balls into his feet, then have to improve. And I think a lot's been made of Robbie Keane going in as a coach and his goal-scoring record of, 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 that he's had for Ireland. But ultimately, what has been underestimated about Robbie Keane is that he was so good really battling against big, robust center halves and the ball being able to stick. Now, that's not necessarily a, a, a technical skill with the ball. It's about using your body well. I'd expect Robbie to work with Maguire on that because that, that, there's no doubt that needs improving. Gary, the, of the four strikers in the squad, uh, the one international goal between them. Yeah. And you know, we, uh, Jeff Hendricks scored the goal the weekend. Before that, we've gone four uh, games without scoring. Is that putting a huge amount of pressure on these guys coming in now? Because... There is that talk of, you know, well, we'd never replace Robbie Keane. We don't have a natural goal scorer. It's brought up all the time. And these guys... By Martin, do- I and I know we all do it as well, but when your yeah. manager continually brings it up... So this will, this will be my frustration for... And certainly for those any of those guys who have played centre forward is that... And Mick alluded to it in the build-up to this game. He's got to find a system that enables these guys to score because I I don't care. Even if we had Robbie Keane in his pomp, he would have struggled to score. So detached was our forward from the rest of the team. So I think all those four forwards now will probably be looking at the work that's been done on the training ground, the fact that we're getting midfielders in support, we're getting further up the pitch. And I think they'll be looking and thinking, well, listen, if this team does create chances, how exciting to be potentially the guy who could be on the end of them. Excuse me, sorry. Um, what ab- how, thank you. Uh, <laughs> how about how about Hendrick and Horahan as a midfield duo then? I like Horahan in terms of how he played. I just want to see a bit more personality from him. That's all because he's in fine form with Villa. Goals, assists, a great stage in his career. New manager comes in and immediately says, "Listen, I've always liked him. I wanted to sign him." So that should be a massive boost. The frustration for me, when I talk about personality, certainly, and, and I know that Mick will be bullish about this and demanding that he suddenly starts flexing his muscles a bit, his chest comes out a bit more, was that he put in three or four brilliant deliveries and then James McLean asked for the ball off him and he gave it to him yeah. in a dead ball situation. And I'm thinking, no, you're doing brilliantly. Discard that and mm. put that ball in a box. And that's what I want to see from him now, that confidence. Mm. And I have no doubt that a lot of those players will get that from Mick McCarthy. He'll say to him, listen, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I've got massive faith in you. But it's up to you ultimately to prove that you are good enough to play at this level. I mean, Gary, the type of game, we, we sort of have an idea what the type of game it will be tomorrow because we play Georgia mm-hmm. so often. And we know the type of team they are and we know how they can frustrate Ireland. So like sometimes players, you hear players and managers say we need to be aggressive and play on the front foot. But sort of tactically, what does that mean in terms of what, like, what approach do you want to see from Ireland in the first 10, 15 minutes tomorrow to maybe address what we've lacked in previous games against Georgia at home? Well, Dan, even as bad as that game was in Gibraltar, I could see, I could see what they were trying to do, and I could see that, that the the failings of our teams in previous seasons was being addressed. I don't think those problems are going to be solved overnight. There's no doubt about it. But ultimately, and as I said earlier, centre halves have to get the team up the pitch. It's as simple as that. Now, I know at times our defenders have looked vulnerable when they have um, given space in behind. And people may well start to think, well, I don't really suit them. It doesn't matter. They need to be coached and they will be coached in terms of getting high up the pitch, good body shape so they can read situations in behind. But by getting the team up the pitch, we will be on the front foot. We will have our midfielders getting in the face of the Georgians. They won't be dominating possession like they did last time in Dublin, which was an embarrassment. And that's not condescending to them. I would say that to any team who comes to Dublin. I think it, it, it always used to be, regardless of the fact that we had a better team, I'm, that, again, not being disrespectful, it, it's obvious no, we had better true, players yeah. But 
we didn't allow anyone to dictate. We're in their face. We try to make it that Dublin and Lansdowne before the Aviva now, that the, colla- that the crowd played their part, that they, they made that environment. The energy was got there and we made it difficult. But certainly when you've seen the likes of Austria, Wales, Denmark, of course, and Serbia coming, they've come to Dublin and actually enjoyed it, as did the Georgians who probably went away thinking they were hard done by, by our, our, our kind of fortuitous one nil win, fortuitous, sorry. Mm. Um, about 30 seconds left. I, I presume you're predicting an Irish win, but like... I don't know, these still feel sticky enough to me, like 1-2-0, fine, get out of there, no? Well, I would take 2 nil all day long. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. 1-0, uh, would you three, take 1-0? I'll take three points at this stage because yeah. it's a work in progress. This team doesn't go from how low they were to suddenly being what we want them to be again and a, 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 a team in the philosophy of Irish teams, front foot, aggressive, making it difficult. That don't happen overnight. Mm. But having said that, as bad as that performance was on Saturday we can get to back to what we are about quicker than that performance suggests. Mm, okay. Listen, appreciate your time as always. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. Good Cheers. luck. Gary Breen there. Off the ball on News Talk. Football Index is reinventing football betting. You can buy and sell the world's top players. Their value may go up and down, but it's not over with the final whistle like a regular bet. Football Index, reinventing football betting. Start building your portfolio today at footballindex.co.uk or download the app now. New customers only, minimum deposit and conditions apply. Gamble responsibly. Am I getting ripped off? Is there a better deal out there? (gasps) Did I forget mum's birthday? We all have that doubting voice in our head that loves to question everything. But if you're an Electric Ireland electricity and gas customer, it's already quiet because you know you're getting the best long-term value on the market. Not a customer? Then call us on 1850 30 50 90 or visit electricireland.ie today and lose that doubting voice. Electric Ireland. Smarter living. Estimated annual bill €1,673. Average consumption, urban 24-hour. Discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax. Residential, dual fuel, direct debit and online billing. Terms and conditions apply. See electricireland.ie slash EAB. Rates at 28th of February 2019. Subject to change. Off the ball. This this is News Talk. So uh, pretty much done for this evening. OTB AM live tomorrow. They'll have Paul Howard with the lads talking John Delaney, which will be worth catching for sure. All our social channels, OTB AM 7.45. Then uh, tomorrow we're at the Aviva. We'll be on the air from 7. We'll have full match commentary. Nathan, Stephen Ward on duty. We'll be there uh, from 7 talking, well, who knows what. Uh, how many statements between now and then? Uh, still to come, um, we have our road show as well on Wednesday. This is at the Olympia. Michael Check, a guest of honour. Malcolm O'Kelly, Shane Jennings, Stephen Ferris, Keith Wood. If you want to come along, offtheball.com forward slash events for the last few tickets. Always a really good night at the Olympia in association with Heineken Rugby Club. That is us done. My thanks to Kieran and Dan. And Tom Dunn is on the way.